In this short video, I'm going to talk about the influence of human rights on land law. Now, human rights and land law don't at first sight appear a natural bedfellows. Land law is frequently provides hard edge rules to determine who is entitled to own, occupy or otherwise use the land. It's often seen as a competition between rights with the winner taking all. Central to that judgment is often economic values promoted by certainty and efficiency. For example, in registration regimes that help uh, in the easy and swift dealings with land. Human rights, on the other hand, is concerned with promoting certain political and social norms considered as essential to human freedom and dignity. It's often outward looking, seeking to reconcile competing imperatives, taking into account a wide range of concerns, but with the individual at the centre. Now, there have been many property cases between the Euro uh, before the European Court and since the Human Rights Act before our domestic courts. So how have the courts um, Rec try to reconcile these apparently diverse outlooks. How are they coming together? Now, this is a complicated and very controversial subject, but I'm going to tr talk now about three influences which I think is emerging from this action interaction uh, and which I hope you will uh, think about. Now, the first one is definitions. How do we define and understand key property relationships. Now, land law is centrally concerned with how we limit and define those relationships that combine third parties. You've no doubt learnt about the distinction between a lease and a licence, for example, or what rights over a neighbour's land count as an easement. But as an international instrument, the European Convention on human rights uh, adopts an autonomous meaning to its central concepts, freed from individual states' understanding of property rights. So one prime example is the meaning of home in the human right to respect for the home in Article 8. The meaning of home in Article 8 goes beyond legal entitlement to occupy a particular residence that flows, for instance, from ownership a lease or even a license. It looks instead to the sufficient and continuing links that an individual has with a place that they live. Now that sounds and is actually a pretty vague concept, although it's a test that's actually proved pretty easy to meet. The European Court of Human Rights talked in Connors and the UK of rights of central importance to the individual's identity, self-determination, physical and mental integrity, and the maintenance of relationships and a settled and secured place in the community. So it's really about the social and psychological connections that a person develops with their particular dwelling and the community in which they live. These links can be as much enjoyed by a tenant, for example, whose property right has come to an end, or even by a squatter who never had a property right at all. We thus have the potential for human rights-based property protection of the home, which goes beyond property rights. And it's indeed, it's what we see in the public authority repossession cases based on mandatory grounds in Manchester City Council and Pinnock and Hounds, uh, Hounslow London Borough uh, Council and Powell. Now it's true that these impact of these cases are not proved significant but this concept of home begins to challenge how we look at land beyond its economic value to take some account of the emotional connections that develop when land is used as a home. It nudges our perceptions of what property rights the law should protect. And indeed, we do see in our law some special protection 
uh, of the home in repossession proceedings. For instance, when a mortgagee repossesses a home, we have Section 36 of the Administration of Justice Act, 1970. And we may yet see it when Parliament considers, if they ever do, no-fault tenant evictions. Now, the next influence uh, I want to, to look at is proportionality. Now, the human rights that we're primarily concerned with, for instance, Article 1, Protocol 1 and Article 8, are qualified rights. And infringement can be, and often is, justified. So when it, looking at Article 1, Protocol 1, a deprivation or control of property is fine when it's in the public or general interest. So, for instance, we can compulsory purchase land to build a hospital, or perhaps more controversially at the present time, HS2. In the case of Article 8, an infringement can be justified if it addresses a pressing social need, like the protection of national security, public safety and health, the economic well-being of the country, or perhaps significantly for land law, the rights and freedoms of others. So, for instance, you know, repossession of a home can be perfectly justified when a public authority is trying to control antisocial behaviour or perhaps to recover rent arrears. Now, the key concept in determining whether an interference is justified is proportionality. Our law in the past has developed various tests and in fact still has them to balance rights. For instance, it might ask, is it reasonable? Is it conscionable or fair? But proportionality is a concept which is drawn from constitutional law, so it's rather new for property lawyers. It's a test that looks to whether an infringement with a human right is appropriate, whether it's necessary to achieve one of those legitimate aims, and importantly, whether it strikes a fair balance between the legitimate aim and the victim's human rights, so that, for instance, the victim doesn't suffer an excessive burden. It thus considers the particular circumstances of the victim. Now, there's quite a bit of controversy over the concept of proportionality in how it operates, but certainly in possession proceedings and cases like Pinnock and Powell, the Supreme Court has fought hard to constrain its impact. And in MacDonald and MacDonald, they refused to accept that proportionality was applicable where a private landlord was seeking possession. At least that's where Parliament has expressly sanctioned that eviction. However, landlords can't ignore proportionality. Parliament, for example, has employed the concept in the Equality Act 2010 to determine if an eviction, whether by a public or a private landlord, which discriminates indirectly, is justified. We in, Interesting, we also find the concept creep, creeping in to judges' vocabulary. For example, in granting relief, remedial relief to satisfy an estoppel, we find the court in Jennings and Rice and in other cases saying that the remedy must be proportionate, reflecting a balance between the property right promised and the detriment suffered. Similarly, the courts have tempered the rather draconian remedy of forfeiture of a lease by saying it needs to be proportionate. Now, the third and last influence I'm going to talk about is process. Because if proportionality is here to stay, then we need a process by which we can work out whether an interference is proportionate. And that process will firstly have to bring the issue before a court for independent assessment, and secondly, affords the court sufficient discretion to make that proportionality judgment. And we find the Strasbourg courts time and again emphasising the importance of procedural safeguards. Now, this presents a problem, for example, to mandatory rights to possession and clear but inflexible rules.
the problem was really at the heart of both Pinnock and Powell cases. The mandatory rights to possession in those cases were found to be incompatible because the court had no discretion to judge whether a particular eviction was proportionate. And so the Supreme Court had to interpret the legislation to grant themselves the necessary discretion. Likewise, the lack of procedural safeguards was the most significant issue at stake in the attack on adverse possession in, in um, Pi and the UK because um, the particular uh, land, uh, the land registration rules at stake under the 1925 Act, uh, an owner could automatically be deprived of their ownership on the expiry of the 12-year limitation period. So although human rights has not made a big impact on many individual property cases as yet, its influence may yet prove more subtle. In pre presenting a different set of property-based values to influence our legislators and our decision makers, and presenting alternative and more contextual forms of reasoning Human rights highlights that property relationships are not just shaped by private agreements, but also by governments and other public authorities whose power is not, and I would say should not, be limitless, but needs to consider the influence, the individual, particularly those who are more vulnerable. 